coming up on today's show. So as a professional organizer, you know, I, I don't have a lot of stuff in my house, but it's funny when I opened things up and started really looking, I do have more than what I need. Are there other ways that we can kind of, uh, I don't know, have a system or something that we do to make keeping our stuff at the office to a minimum? One is that a lot of stuff comes into our home that we don't buy. That it just comes in so, every, you know, the child comes home from a party at school, the child comes home from every birthday party with a bag of favors or Valentine's Day with a, a bag of candy, and that happens all year long. Highlights from our fourth Organizer 411 event today on Keeping You Organized. Hello and welcome to Keeping You Organized. Today we're going to feature highlights from our fourth live Organizer 411 event featuring professional organizers Amy Tokus and Shauna Turner. So now let's get into the highlights of Organizer 411. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to our fourth Organizer 411 event uh, brought to you by Smead. Let me uh, introduce Amy Tokus. Amy, how are you today? I am good. How are you doing today, John? Great. Tell us uh, uh, where you live and the name of your business and some little facts about you. Okay. I am Amy Tokus. I live in Omaha, Nebraska, and I am the owner of Freshly Organized, and I have a couple of other professional organizers that work with me there. And then I am an engineer by degree, but I work as a professional organizer now, and I have four kids. So <laughs> that's kind of my background. Well, that, that seems plenty. That's a lot to organize right there. <laughs> yeah, uh, totally. Also joining us is Shauna Turner from the Shauna Method. Shauna, how are you today? Hey, John. I'm doing great. Happy to be here. How are you doing? Our overarching theme is getting organized for summer, but we're not limited to that. We're going to talk about a bunch of different things today, uh, the questions that you submit, uh, some questions that were uh, submitted uh, in advance by people, and then also uh, anything that you want to talk about uh, within reason. And Le we have Leanne in the background moderating for us. But um, you know, before we started the live uh, broadcast, Amy kind of uh, got my curiosity going. I, I want you to talk, Amy, just for a moment about the art of minimalism, uh, because I think that's kind of a hot topic right now. And you know, people want to know how to get by with less. So uh, yes. why don't you kick us off with that? You know, um, it's interesting. I went to a conference recently for the National Association of Professional Organizers, and we had the minimalist come and present one of the keynotes. And these two guys were uh, pretty inspirational on living with less and how to do it. So as a professional organizer, you know, I, I don't have a lot of stuff in my house, but it's funny when I open things up and started really looking, <laughs> I do have more than what I need. And one of the things that they said that really caught my attention was um, the point of us having things just in case. And they even said those are the three most dangerous words in the dictionary here <laughs> that just in case. So I think um, we've all been uh, guilty of saying that. Yes, yeah, we keep it just in case. So it's since I came back the last month or I don't know how long it's been, a few weeks, a month, I've been going through all of my cabinets and closets and things like that. And I am just amazed at how much I've been keeping just in case that I never use. Like I came across some old hot rollers that I've had since I was a teenager and I've got three teenage girls and I kept thinking well one of them might want to use these just in case and I'm like okay one's off in college she's never gonna use the hot rollers <laughs> so they have other tools but it's just stuff like that and I have the space thankfully but I don't need all this stuff. So it's been very liberating. I just set up a box and started throwing five, ten things in a day. And things have piled up. And I'm just amazed at how much you can clean out and not have to maintain. I don't have to maintain any of that stuff anymore. What's well, interesting, we get, uh, you know, I'm sure like most people, things from the vets and from lupus. Yeah. And uh, every month we get, and I, I, we put stuff out every month, and we still seem to have a lot of stuff. So uh, yeah. what's the deal with that? 
Well, if you think about it, things just keep coming in. <laughs> we, we don't stop bringing things in, and we we purchase things that uh, you know we may not really need, or we purchase things for occasions, and then we hang on to them just in case we ever need them again. So you know, not only getting rid of stuff, but trying to reduce what you bring in is really key. And also focusing on what's really important. I was talking to a client recently and she was talking about they have a cabin up at a lake and she talked about how much she loved spending time at that cabin because there's nothing there. It's just her and her family and they're relaxing. She's like, I don't have to maintain anything. I just have to clean up our mess from that day, and then we go off and have fun. There's nothing else to do. Oh, I totally relate. We have a cabin, same thing. In fact, I decided when I got the cabin that we, uh, I had to have enough clothing up there so that I didn't have to pack to take stuff with me. So I, that's my yeah. little game. I don't pack my suitcase or anything. We just bring <laughs> up food, and everything yeah. I need is up there. So Right, great. yeah. Well, yeah. Sean... Shauna, let's talk about this minimalism thing. Uh, what What are your thoughts on that? And, and more importantly, how do people become minimalists? What do they need to do? Do you have any tips on that? You know, as I was listening to Amy talk, a few things were popping into my mind. One is that a lot of stuff comes into our home that we don't buy. That it just comes in so, every, you know, the child comes home from a party at school. The child comes home from every birthday party with a bag of favors or Valentine's Day with a a bag of candy and that happens all year long or a lot of times maybe we go to events we go to a home show we go to a meeting we go to a presentation and we walk home with a goodie bag giveaway or an agenda from the meeting or freebies that were at the conference so we we bring stuff in that we're not even consciously buying and it's still showing up so that was popping into my mind because I thought we just need to be very diligent in thinking about what are we going to let across the threshold of our home or even our office. Uh, I Nowadays, I don't even bring the agenda home or the paperwork for the meeting or the brochure. I just trash it before I leave the room or I give it back to the person and say use it with someone else because I don't want to have to make a decision on it later. That, so we, I think we had a question on that from Megan who asked about, well, how do you do this minimalism stuff at the office? And that was a great example about the agenda. Are there other ways that we can kind of, uh, I don't know, have a system or something that we do to make keeping our stuff at the office to a minimum? I think that it's important to always know where are we going to put our things. So we're intentional when we, whenever we pick up an item and we're headed back to the office, we have to be able to know where am I going to put this when I walk in the door. Not just put it down and dump it on the desk, but say, do I have a space to keep this? And if not, that doesn't necessarily mean don't bring it back, but it means I need to really be ready to spend a minute or two when I walk in to find it a home. So we have to only bring in what fits. We need to allow the space to be the boundary. And if the boundary's full, we can't bring anything more in until we've cleared out some space somewhere. So if the file drawer is full, then probably we need to schedule a morning to make some space in that file drawer to get ready. And, and you could do that quarterly, or you could do it at the end of a project, or you could do it as you're switching from one uh, focus area to another. So when there's a natural break, don't just allow that stuff to stick around. Take the break. Give yourself a day to clear through your files and make some space for what's coming. That, that's a great point, and that uh, dovetails on another question actually from Megan as well. She said, my, my husband and I both work full-time outside of the home. Uh, Amy, let's ask you this one. How do we make the transition from the school year, you know, papers, projects, et cetera, uh, to summer? Our, our heads are barely above water as it's now sports <laughs> activities, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. And we'll be able to organize. How do you, how do you make that transition into summer? Okay, so this is a crazy time of the year for end of the school year, families, activities, all that stuff. You just really have to um, work on, number one, keep your head above the water and focus on what's happening now. And then break things into small projects, whether it's in your office or at home. Don't look at all the school papers and say, I've got to sit down for four hours on Saturday morning and spend all that time organizing school papers. Get all the school papers together on one spot 
and then you know take 15 minutes a day and just sort through and you'll be surprised once you start looking at it and touching it you'll realize some of that stuff you don't even want you're not going to keep it it's just been put aside because you were delaying the decision on it but when you go through it you'll be able to minimize it some and but don't make it this great big huge project because then you'll never do it it'll sit there all summer and you'll come in the next school year and you'll still have it sitting there so just do small pieces of it that'll help well and and you you use those words delayed decision yeah. um what what do you mean? Let's let's expand on that because we we actually have a whole podcast on that. But this delayed decision, why do people do it, and how do we overcome that? Um, well, it's so hard to overcome. But sometimes papers come in, and we'll look at them, and we can't decide. So it could be an event we could possibly want to go to, but we're not really sure. We have to talk to other people or a piece of artwork from your child you look at it and you're like yeah I don't know if I want to keep this or not so what we do is we set it aside to think about think about <laughs> in reality it gets put in a pile and usually people who do a lot of delayed decisions have piles sitting there of things that they weren't sure they wanted to do and they went to, they delayed it so um, when you have piles like that if you come back a lot of those decisions have already passed and they're easily you can just flip through it just you've already made the decision but the paper was still there so um, yeah preventing delayed decisions is just practice you have to look at things and you have to say yes no or containing things to say I need to decide later so all of your delayed decisions are all together instead of getting them stuck in all the other paperwork and then when you see all those papers that are all together that you need to decide on then your decision making skills will start kicking in mm -hmm. Sean what do you what do you think about delayed decision I know this is a hot topic in fact we have a an article on LinkedIn it's, it's like our top article because mm -hmm. I don't people really relate with this I think yeah. a lot of people struggle to make decisions period because they're afraid of making the wrong decision mm -hmm. And so somehow putting it aside takes away that temporary feeling of discomfort. But of course, all you're doing is making yourself feel that feeling at a future point. And so <laughs> what I like to try to do with clients is to alleviate some of that pain that they associate with making the decision. And typically, I find that it's tough in the beginning. So let's say we sit down and there's a huge stack of paper and that feels overwhelming, just like Amy was saying. But if we take it one page at a time, What's, what The first page may take a long time. We have discussions. The second page may be same thing. But then as you go through the pile, it gets a little easier and a little easier because you come across things that fit into really just a couple of categories. So once you decide, how am I going to deal with items that fit in this category? Once you decide how to deal with that, it gets easier the next time you come across something that fits that category. So I always say start. You, just like Amy said, you don't need to do Start. the whole pile today. Let's say we're just going to deal with these 10 pieces of paper. And when you've done 10, you can quit. You know, We can go do something easier. But it gets easier and easier once you start, whereas when you delay the decision, you're just really creating future discomfort. So tell yourself that when you pick up something and say, I'll just put it here for later. Say to yourself, I'm really making something harder for myself later. Whereas if I could summon the courage to decide today, I'm actually doing myself a favor in the future. We'll be back with more Organizer 411 highlights in a moment. When you've got it together, everyone can tell. Your confidence is obvious. Introducing Viewables.com from Smeed. Use the Viewables labeling system to transform your drawer of hanging files into a tidy, organized filing system. Using the premium hanging folder tabs, see the label from the front, top, and back. It's easy. Access viewables.com from any computer, tablet, or internet-enabled smartphone. Let's make some labels. It's free, and there's nothing to download or install. Choose the label type and format your label just the way you want. You can even add index characters or icons for distinctive filing. Set up a free Viewables Cloud account and your secure login lets you save your projects for convenient access from any computer. 
And with Viewable's multi-purpose labels, you can use one label for any type of file, including hanging folders, top tab folders, super tab folders, or oversized items like notebooks and file boxes. Upload a list of file headings and print your complete set of labels in moments. There's even a library of templates for commonly used label sets. It's never been easier to set up neat looking files that have easy to read headings and efficient color codes. Obviously organized. Viewables.com. From Smead, keeping you organized. We're back now on Keeping You Organized today, featuring highlights from our fourth live Organizer 411 event featuring professional organizers Amy Tokus and Shauna Turner. Now let's get back to the highlights. All right, Amy, I'm going to move on to a question from Paula, which says, uh, help, my to-do list oh. never shortens less than 12 pages in length, although I'm constantly adding items and deleting items, <laughs> but it's still lengthy. I have no sense of accomplishment, just frustration. Any suggestions on how to take a to-do list that's 12 pages long and, <laughs> and do something with it? <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> okay, yes. So my guess is there are things on your to-do list that could be really long-term. So if you have 12 pages of to-dos, then there's things on there that you're probably, you know, you may, could be single and you have get married on your to-do list, <laughs> but you got to meet somebody. So um, there's a lot of steps that you're probably putting in there and writing things down that aren't necessary. What, when people have huge to-do lists, which I've never seen a 12 page, so I'd be really impressed to see it, but I would say the easiest thing to do to feel some accomplishment is pick your top three priorities on your to-do list. Put, write them down so you have three, and then get those three done, and then pull three more off, and so you feel like you're actually getting things done. So, um, and those should be small, Smart, those smart goals, that's what they should be. They need to be smart to do's, not getting married or get married. You know, make sure it's smart, it's small, it's or specific, measurable, all those things to make it a good task to put on your to do list. Shauna, how about you and to do lists? Any right. ideas on how to reduce that down? Yeah, I got two tips. One is don't confuse projects and tasks. Oh, yeah. So the project is the big thing you want to do, which might be clean out the garage. But under projects, let's put the items on the to-do list that are actually tasks, such as sort through the bin on the floor near the door. So that's really small and manageable, and uh, like Amy was saying, it's, it's, it's something you can actually tackle and see through to completion. So don't put big projects on your, on your list. The other thing is, and I'm a big fan of this, is to schedule your tasks instead of just write them on one never-ending to-do list because the never-ending to-do list feels like laundry you know it's never empty you're never finished you can never cross it all off so I like to schedule tasks onto a calendar so onto a day by day you won't you'll never finish your whole list but if you pick three things like Amy said or maybe you say tomorrow I'm gonna work on these eight things you do have a chance of finishing eight things and then at the end of the eight things, you feel a sense of accomplishment. You look down and say, yeah, I did my eight things for today. Even though there's more things, some of them maybe are scheduled for tomorrow. Or some of them I actually don't really need to start working on until next Friday when I know I'll have a window. So actually schedule the, the tasks onto certain days of your calendar, being intentional about knowing which days on your calendar you actually have time to work on them. If you're in a meeting from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m., that is not a good day to schedule a long list of tasks because you are already busy. Yeah, you know, uh, what, this sounds a lot like, and I don't know if either of you uh, uh, are familiar, I'm sure you're familiar with David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, where he talks about dumping everything onto a big list. This sounds like the big mind dump. Uh, mm -hmm. So what's the next step? I think, Shauna, you talked about that maybe sorting between projects and tasks. Mm -hmm. Amy, anything else to add on that, how we take that list down and, and you know, get it to something more manageable? Yeah, I liked what Shauna said about the task, making sure your list are task and not grand projects because the tasks are doable and projects have many tasks to them. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
then again, picking your top three, because if you pick your top three that are high priority, get them done, maybe it's the low hanging fruit, so you have some sense of accomplishment, and then pick three more, and you just keep chugging along until your list is done. And then you also have to be um, reasonable with your list and really be, be tough about it because if it's 12 pages long, then, you know, what else are you doing with your time? Because <laughs> I'm sure that's not your whole life as do it, taking care of that list. So, you know, you have to make sure that, um, that you're, you have reasonable expectations of yourself. I, that's that's great advice. Well, we're going to move on to a question from Terry, uh, and uh, this question is about organizing. Her boss has asked her to organize some family photos and memorabilia. Mm -hmm. uh, Shauna, anything on ways to do that? Right. So whenever you have files of photos, you could either have a stack of paper photos, or you might have a digital dump on your computer. But we tend to talk about the ABCs of photos. So. The first thing you want to do is what I'd call the quick sort, and you want to sort them into A is for album. So these would be the really nice photos, the ones that are clear and you like the way you look in them or her boss looks in them or they, they're they sentimental or something like that. B would be sort of what we call box, which would be, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if these should go in an album or not. They're per perfectly good photos, but... You know, maybe there are two or three of the same event or of the same person from a different angle. And then C would be can, as in trash canned. So <laughs> don't be afraid to get rid of photos. Um, we tend to just keep them all. Again, that fear factor, what if I throw away a photo? There is nothing wrong with getting rid of a photo. So the ones that are blurry, the ones that are of a mountain with no people in them, the ones that you took on vacation of a castle that you won't even remember the name of the castle in two years. Just get rid of most of those. So if you're putting together one album, you want the crystal clear ones, the ones that are flattering of the people. Maybe you put a few landmark photos in there just to give a little flavor or an accent. But don't keep them all. Don't put them all in. Nobody wants to look at all that anyway. So you're better off to have one or two albums that or boxes that have the best that you'll look at again and again rather than having crates and crates or seven folders on your desktop that you will never look in because it just feels like work. Uh, before we wrap up, I do want to um, give each of you guys a chance because I know you have a local practice but you also do some virtual um, uh, uh, organizing as well. So let's start with Shauna. Tell, uh, tell us about your practice, what kinds of customers you work with and how people can get a hold of you. Thanks, John, for the chance. Yes, I, my business is called The Shauna Method. I'm out of uh, Darien, Connecticut, which is really a New York City suburb, so I work in Lower Connecticut and Westchester, uh, New York. But I am also I'm a heavy on social media, and I want people to know they can access a lot of free information by going to either my website, which is theshaunamethod.com, or also checking me out on Facebook or Pinterest or Twitter so that you can access some free tips and ideas. If you're interested in working with me virtually, and I do do this, we can do a lot of coaching through Skype or um, FaceTime. You can just fill out a contact form on my website, and I will be in touch. Awesome. Amy, tell us a little bit about your practice, uh, the kinds of clients you work with, and how people can get a hold of you. You know, I am very similar to Shauna. I do all the residential. I do offices. Um, and you can go to my website, freshlyorganized.com. There's a contact sheet if you're interested. We have packages. We have a blog on the website with lots of tips. And then our Facebook page for Freshly Organized also has lots of tips out there. So just give us a call. Or uh, I would love, I love doing the virtual stuff via FaceTime and Skype. It's always fun. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we have for today's Organizer 411 highlights. You can watch the entire live Organizer 411 event by going to smead.com forward slash hangout. This is John Hunt from Smead saying, see you next time on Keeping You Organized. Coming up next time on Keeping You Organized. 
Well, absolutely you should have a filing system, and it doesn't have to be a big elaborate filing system like you would see in an office, but a place mm -hmm. to keep track of the paper that comes into our homes. But let's talk about, you know, there's maybe a little higher volume in offices and, and more paper. Well, that, so. that's the key right there, John, because at home we have a certain amount of papers that we have to deal with, but the office, probably what we deal with in a week or, or two weeks at home is equivalent to what we deal with and manage in a day. Yeah.